Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Alistair Don Donaldson. Uh, he's visiting us today and tomorrow. Uh, from Oxford University. Uh, Alistair got his uh, PhD from the University of Glasgow, and then he worked for a few years in the industry at Codeplay Software, uh, working on multi-core compilation. After that, he decided to come back to academia. He's now a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the University of Oxford. And he's going to tell us today about uh, some work he's been doing on uh, verification of concurrent programs. <coughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, during the talk, please feel free to ask questions and interrupt me. I'm sure that's what you do anyway. So yeah, that's, that's what I like. So um, this is work on applying predicate abstraction to replicated concurrent programs and trying to do that efficiently by taking advantage of symmetry. And it's joint work with Daniel Croning, Alexander Kaiser, and mostly Thomas Wall at the University of Oxford. So, as you very well know, uh, one of the major formal method success stories is, has been the SLAM project. So taking a load of really well understood formal verification techniques, theorem proving techniques, uh, combining them with novel techniques for making this work on real C programs, yeah, and building a tool that can be used to verify <coughs> device drivers. But despite this success, I think it's fair to say that there's not been very much progress on applying predicate abstraction to shared variable concurrent programs. And the reason for this is state space explosion. So Abstraction may be more expensive if you have multiple threads, and also the verification of a concurrent Boolean program becomes intractable as the number of threads increase. So in this work, we've been contributing to this situation by designing a, a scalable predicate abstraction and CGAR-based model checker, which is geared towards verifying replicated C programs. And we achieve scalability by exploiting the replicated structure of these programs using symmetry reduction, and in particular, building on recent work by my collaborators, um, Thomas Wall and Daniel Croning, and also Gerard Basler, who was an intern here some years ago, on doing symmetry reduction for symbolic model checking using a technique called symbolic counter abstraction. So I'm not going to tell you about symbolic counter abstraction during this presentation, but that's the technology that makes this work well, as well as the, the novel abstraction technique that I'll show you. Is it counter or Sorry? What does counter mean? Oh, counter abstract. Well, I'm gonna. I will explain that later. Yeah. A counter that comes up. Or is so it this is this, it's this thing I, I showed you on the board where you count the number of processes in each state. Okay. Each local state. So counting. it's an abs no, so it's counting abstraction. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, I, guess, I guess maybe that would be a better name. In the literature, it's referred to as counter abstraction, um, and it's an exact method. So it doesn't lose precision despite being an abstraction. It doesn't lose precision. I know. Discuss that a bit more later. So the source of programs we check, don't want you to read this program in too much detail, but the, what I mean by replicated program is we have some loop that launches an unknown number of threads, and we say that this number is going to be bounded. So our model checker will just stop if it launches more than five threads, if you say the bound is five. And then all threads run the same program. This is um, uh, an example of building a lock using test and set instructions. And I'll talk a little bit more about this example later on. So all threads are going to run the same program, and you'll see there's no use of thread identity in the code for these threads. So this is the sorts of programs we are thinking about. So um, a little more specifically, in our model of computation, we assume no recursion. And in this work, we inline all procedures. And I'll talk at the end later about ways we might lift these restrictions to some extent. So yeah, sorry. OK. Why should we do symbolic model checking of concurrent programs and, and tools that do explicits? So if, if your program has data, like integers, then explicit state exploration won't be able to provide you with full state space coverage. And uh, the interplay between data and concurrency is significant enough? Well, I suppose that would depend on, on individual examples. But um, certainly, if you gave this to a tool like SPIN, unless you did a manual abstraction to explicitly remove all data, then SPIN would just get stuck exploring like data value after data value after data value. And wouldn't necessarily wouldn't necessarily find any useful bugs or show that, that no bugs exist. So, uh, if there is lots of interplay between 
control flow and data values, then actually predicate abstraction probably wouldn't work very well either on these examples. The idea is predicate abstraction gets rid of the, the, the data problem. Right, so, so SLAM was partially successful because it built on formal methods and all these good techniques, but also because it had device drivers as a motivating example. So I, I guess um, one question is sort of what's your motivating example of this sort of <coughs> kind of system that yeah, so, this template? So the examples that we found are approach works well on are actually lock-free data structures. So in, in um, this, we're building a lock using atomic instructions. So um, we, yeah, we can check that, that these assertions won't fail. And we, we don't care too much about the actual context in which this lock is being used, right? I see. So, so the, the idea is that your, your main routine is really sort of a harness where you're simulating men an unknown number of clients of essentially a, a passive library, a, a library that might do synchronization, but it's not creating threads itself. Exactly. Well, that, that is the, the benchmarks that we've tried this technique on. That's exactly the, the situation. So if you had a larger concurrent program with many other threads doing different things, then you might need to extract something from that concurrent program for this technique to, to, to tell you something meaningful. I see. Yeah. So, um, okay, so we, we're assuming this sort of program structure we inline all procedures. And then we have some restrictions on pointers. So we allow pointers within a thread. We allow pointers between variables of the thread. We allow pointers from a thread's local variables into the shared state. And we allow pointers between the shared state. But in this work, we don't allow pointers from the shared state into a thread's local state. The reason being that this would give us, um, this would break our asynchronous model of computation where threads proceed by modifying their own local state in the shared state. If we allow these kind of pointers, then a thread could use such a pointer to directly manipulate another thread's state. And by barring these sorts of pointers, we also bar pointers between the local states of threads, because you could only get such a pointer by communicating it through the shared state. So we haven't found this rest restriction to be a problem in practice. This would correspond really to giving away the address of a stack variable to the shared state, which some programmers will do, but it's, I would say, genuinely regarded as quite bad practice. Only stack states? No. So in this work, yeah, local state is stack state. We would regard the heap as being shared state. But typically you, you, you could, ha yeah, you could allocate Closing some of your private space. I mean. So you could, allocate your, you could allocate memory in the stack and use that in a thread local way. So um, with, our, with our current tool, the tool would just assume that is shared state. So there has been like, some interesting research on trying to do analysis of programs to determine which variables are shared and which variables are local, depending on the way they're used. Asynchronous program, you, you often have a thug that's invalidated and then you migrate from thread to thread as threads are. So you pass something from one thread to another? Yeah. And then would you then regard it, once so you passed it, would you... Essentially local to that thread. And you would still regard it as part of the original thread's local state? Oh, any, it's local to any given thread. Right. OK, but once you pass it to another thread, would you regard it as being local to that other thread? Yeah, so I mean, I'm not sure if you could model that directly in, in C and have our tool work successfully on it. But essentially, that, that's not the problem we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid the problem of one thread being able to directly change the state of another thread. But he can model it, right? Because that thumb will be allocated on the heap. It, and but, then, but then it would be shared state. It would be shared state. state. Yeah, so, so we would just treat it as shared state. Yeah. So, um, yeah, m maybe after the presentation we could talk through an example that would do that. And, yeah, I'm, oh, no, no, I, I'm delighted to be. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, what, and one of the things I would, so Tom asked the question about what kind of examples are we looking at. And we have a class of examples where this method is useful. We'd be very interested in trying to expand that class of examples. And if you have ideas on that, that would be, that would be great. Um, OK, so, and then also we're assuming a strong memory model. And we're assuming in this work statement level granularity. So threads interleave at statement level, which is obviously unrealistic. You can avoid this problem by pre-processing your input essentially into three address code. This strong memory model problem, we're looking forward to dealing with in future work. We have a new researcher, Jade Alglave, who's an expert in memory models. So I'm hoping to collaborate with her on extending this to. Consistent. Yeah. OK. So now I'm going to do a, a very quick recap of the Cartesian abstraction. I'm not sure if this is necessary for this audience. I wasn't sure if there would be many more people here, but I'll go through it fairly quickly. So if we have a set of predicates, phi 1 up to phi m, what we're going to do is abstract a program 
Uh, this is sequential predicate abstraction. We're going to abstract a program to produce a Boolean program where variables b1 up to bm track these predicates. So by f of phi, I denote the best approximation of the expression phi over our predicates. So f strengthens phi to the weakest thing we can express over, sorry, strengthens psi to the weakest thing we can express over the phi, such that f of psi will imply psi. And then um, what choose a comma b means is if a is true, then one, else if b is true, then zero, else star, where star is the non-deterministic expression. And the effect of an assignment statement, st, on a predicate phi is the phi is abstracted as a choice between the weakest precondition for phi to hold after the statement has been executed, but strengthened over our predicates, or the weakest precondition for not phi to hold, but strengthened over our predicates. So this is like the best thing we can say about phi's new value with our current predicates, but considering um, phi in isolation from other predicates. So we turn a statement into a parallel assignment to our Boolean variables, doing this choice for each predicate. So in this work, we are not actually restricted to the Cartesian abstraction. We could have phrased this work in terms of existential abstraction generally. But our motivation for this is that we've written, we've written a paper on this work that we've sent to CAV. And we'd like this paper to be readable and compatible with the seminal work on predicate abstraction from 10 years ago, which introduces the Cartesian abstraction. So we'd like it, someone to be able to read this paper and then read our paper and the notation to be enough, the notation from this paper to be enough to understand what, what we've done. OK. So the goal of our work is we have a, a template program, P, and an integer n. And we want, what we want to do is to check that the parallel composition of n copies of P is correct. And by correct, I mean that no assertions in the template can be violated. So one approach to doing this using existing techniques would be to build the, the program P, n, directly, abstract it, and then check the abstraction. So let's think about how this would work. Suppose we had this very simple program here, and I'm going to write my programs in this simple form where I define shared and local variables and then have some statements rather than giving you whole fragments of C for reasons of space on the slides. So this obviously incorrect for more than one thread program, a shared variable S, a local variable L, we assert that they're different and then increment S. So clearly for more than one thread, this program is incorrect. And say we had this predicate that S and L are different, then what we could do is we could expand this program by multiplying out the threads. So we have the single shared variable, and now we have two instantiations of the template. So we get a local variable L1, a local variable L2, uh, two different assertions. And we also would expand the predicates. So we have a predicate that says S doesn't equal L1 and a predicate that says S doesn't equal L2. And now we could apply predicate abstraction directly to this program to get the program alpha P squared. So this is the program with two threads. So we would use a Boolean variable B1 to track the predicate S not equal to L1, a Boolean B2 to track the corresponding predicate for L2. And then we would get this parallel assignment corresponding to the, the update to S. So um, if S is not equal to L1, then um, we don't know whether it will still not be equal to L1 after the assignment. But if they are equal, then they definitely won't be equal after the assignment. So we get 1 here. So does this make sense so far? This is straightforward application of regular predicate abstraction. And then we could check this. So it would be easy to turn this program into a sequential Boolean program by simulating concurrency with non-determinism. And we could use a model checker like Bebop, or we could use SMV with a suitable transformation from Boolean programs into the SMV language to check this program for two threads. So uh, we would find verification fails. Actually, how do you do that? So this thing of turning a Boolean program into an SMV program. Right. So you just model the program counter um, as uh, a variable. Yeah, and then you just have like, separate variables for all the threads, so all the... So it'll be a basically a big gigantic... Yeah, a big gigantic loop, loop like a monolithic the loop. The non-deterministic yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no recursion, so you just... I see. No loops? Flat. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so well, you can have loops, but... You can have loops, but yeah. call, procedure calls might be difficult. So in, so in this work, we, we've... Okay. Inline procedure calls, yeah. If you wanted to do smart things with procedure calls, then this might be more tricky. Okay. Yeah. So, so the point of this example is that the two threads update two shared variables. So in the original program, the two threads both update this shared variable S. Yeah? Ah. And that means that the assertion will fail for the set for the, after one thread does the update, then the assertion will fail for the other thread. Yeah? Okay. 
So, for so yeah, yeah. So I mean, if both threads do the assertion, then things will be okay. So, so verification failed the counter counter example. Counter yeah. Example. So we would get a count. So here we would get a counter example on the abstract program, and if we simulate this counter example, we'll find it's genuine. Yeah. So it's a yeah. success. So it's a success. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what are the pros and cons of this work? So yeah, the pros are it works in principle, right? So this is a way we can do verification of these kinds of programs. And we can use existing techniques essentially directly. But the problem is it doesn't scale. And we've got experiments later that, that show this. So there are two problems. One is the scalability of the abstraction. So suppose we've got k predicates over our template program p. Then potentially we're going to end up with a, a separate version of each predicate for every thread. So if we had a predicate just over shared variables, then we wouldn't multiply that predicate for every thread. But the predicate at s not equal to l, we've got two predicates corresponding to that predicate. Right? So when we perform abstraction, even if we're abstracting thread one, we have the predicates of related to all the threads available to us when computing the abstraction. And in this example, we, we made use of that. So if I go back to the code for, yeah, here, you can see that in thread one, we're using both b1 and b2, which are the versions of the predicate for thread one and thread two. OK, so abstraction is expensive. And if we multiply the number of predicates, it becomes more expensive. And uh, I guess a less important problem, but maybe still worth noting, is that if we have different values of the number of threads that we care about, then we would have to do different abstractions and check them separately. We can't like do one abstraction and use it for multiple thread counts. But Given your assumptions, you should be able to just have a template that works for all ones. So you mean do abstraction at the template level? Well, I mean, you have this one piece of source code that you know is going to be the main for all threads. Yeah. Right, so the local variables, it's all parametric. Yeah. So, but the thing is that if you multiply the program and then multiply the predicates, then you abstract a thread well, with respect to... You, this is where you do the explicit composition. Yeah. So in this work, we're not doing parameterized model checking, right? We're not trying to check this for an arbitrary number of threads. We're trying to check this for the program where up to some fixed number of threads are launched. Well, so, so, I, so you have a parallel composition that you actually perform and create the program. Yeah. That's, the, that's not what I'm going to propose we actually do, but that's, this is what we could do. This is in the context yeah, yeah. Of, of that. OK. So, yeah. Yes, those assumptions. And then the other problem is that it's not feasible to check this program alpha p to the power n for large thread counts. So we get state space explosion because of concurrent thread interleavings. So we refer to this method as symmetry oblivious predicate abstraction. So we're basically ignoring symmetry here. And in what I'm going to show you next, I'm going to propose a method that takes advantage of symmetry to, to do this in a better way. So uh, potentially a more natural approach. Well, this template program P is not an executable program, but it's a program nevertheless. So what if we could abstract P directly at the level of the template? So to get an abstraction, alpha prime p. So you say alpha prime, not alpha, because the abstraction we do isn't going to be exactly the same as what we would have done in the previous slides. So this will hopefully be cheaper to compute, because we haven't blown up the number of predicates that we're abstracting over. And what we'd like to do is to do this so that when we then take the parallel composition of the resulting Boolean program n times, we get something that over approximates the parallel composition of the template n times. But because we're working at the template level, we should then be able to exploit recent techniques on model checking replicated Boolean programs that exploit symmetry to do the, the model checking efficiently. <coughs> and in addition, we then can just abstract this program P once to get alpha prime P. And then we can try alpha prime P with various thread counts. So we don't have to abstract a separate program for each thread count we're interested in. So I wouldn't be telling you about this unless the answer to this question was, yes, you can do this. And this is what we call symmetry aware predicate abstraction. And it's what I'll tell you about during the rest of the talk. So any questions up to this point? Michelle, yeah. basic question. My understanding is that you're doing bounded verification, right? Bounded even, in the number even if you have loops, you unroll them? Uh, no, no, we don't unroll loops. Don't unroll no, no. So in the, in the Boolean program, there can be loops, right? And sure. the, yeah. Okay. Right. yeah. So we're bounding the number of threads that get created, but we're not bounding the number of context switches. We're not bounding the depth that we search to. We, but we don't have recursion. Right? OK, so a quick overview of symmetry reduction, in case you're not familiar with it. So if we're verifying this replicated program, suppose m was 9. right? And let's just ignore a shared state for, this, for the purposes of this example. Suppose we've checked some state where the threads are in this configuration. So 1 and 2 are in state A, 3, 4, and 5 are in state B, etc. So if we've checked that this state is safe, 
then because these threads are isomorphic, we don't need to check, for example, the state where the identities of processes two and three are being flipped. So because these states are permutations of one another, if we've checked one, we don't need to check the other. Okay, and similarly, we wouldn't need to check this state here where processes six and seven have been flipped, or this one, for example. Um, and actually, the, the model checker, the symmetry exploiter model checker that we use as a backend for our work, which I'm not going to give you details of, uses this technique called counterexample, uh, called counter abstraction. So um, gotcha. this whole equivalence class of states would be represented by this counter abstract state here. So we say there are four processes in local state A, four in local state B, and one in local state C. Um, so we abstr it's abstraction because we abstract away identity. But an important point about counter abstraction, um, yeah, so symmetry reduction can give you a very large reduction in the size of the state space you need to search. So symmetry reduction gives you a bisimilar quotient structure. So it gives you, you're checking something bisimilar to the unreduced structure. And counter abstraction is a method of implementing symmetry reduction, and it, it also gives you bisimulation. So although we call it abstraction, we're not introducing any further over approximation. So in this work, we go from a program template to a concurrent to a Boolean program template. We expand that, and then we model check it using counter abstraction. We lose precision when we do the abstraction, but we don't lose more precision because we're using this technique called counter abstraction in the model checking phase. I gave a I gave a rehearsal of this talk, and someone yeah raised that point, which I guess because I'm so into symmetry, I. I didn't think about it. OK, so um, the idea is we're going to take this template program P, abstract it to get alpha prime P, expand this, and we're going to do it in such a way that our expansion simulates the original program's expansion. But actually, we're going to check the symmetry quotient of our expanded Boolean program. And because this is bisimilar, this is a sound thing to do. All right. So. Uh, I knew I had a heart attack when I looked through the pop-up proceedings and saw a paper with this title, Predicate Abstraction and Refinement for Verifying Multi-Threaded Programs. And I thought, oh no, someone's doing something very similar to us. Um, and then I read the paper, and it's, it's a very nice paper, but it, it concludes with this very encouraging statement, saying, another technique to fight state explosion is to factor out redundancy due to thread replication as proposed in counter-abstraction and implemented in the model checker Boom, which is our tool. Um, we view these techniques as paramount in obtaining practical multi-threaded verifiers. So yeah. This, uh, the heart attack turned into a good feeling of, yeah, other people think that this is a, <laughs> a good thing to be working on. All right. So before I tell you about our approach, I just want to give you um, an indication of how much we had to change the CGAR loop to make this work. So almost everything I'm going to tell you is related to computing the abstraction. We have a novel technique to do predicate abstraction at the template level. Then we had to adapt our boom model checker quite significantly um, into what we call B-boom, because it needs to perform broadcasts as we'll see in what follows. I'm not going to tell you about the details of how we adapted BBOOM, but this was a significant piece of work. Checking feasibility of counterexamples required almost no modification. And at the moment, our tool only refines the abstraction by adding predicates. So this is also very straightforward. And what we're working on now is constrained style refinement to make the abstraction with a given number of predicates more precise. And this is actually not so straightforward in our template level setting. But on the plane here, I think I figured out how to do it. And yeah, uh, it will involve significant work, but is absolutely doable. So this is the, the state of things. Well, this, this, la this last bit isn't the state of things, but that's the state of things. OK, so let's think about how we would do this template level predicate abstraction. So let's consider this simple example here, where we have a local variable L a shared variable s, um, a shared variable t, which I think I should remove because I don't use it in the example. Uh, yeah, and we're not actually, I don't care about this program, but, the, but suppose we've got two predicates. Oh, you know, yeah, sorry, we do have a predicate s is equal to t. That's why I need t. So we've got this predicate s is equal to t and a predicate l is equal to 4. And what we want to do is to turn this into a Boolean program. So we can abstract the statements directly using Cartesian abstraction. And clearly, we're going to need a Boolean to represent each of these predicates. So now the question is, because we're going to expand this to a concurrent Boolean program, the, the Boolean variables need to have a scope. So they either need to be local or they need to be shared. So in this example, what do we want to do for these predicates? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that we would want the predicate s equals t over shared variables to be a shared variable. And we want the predicate just over local state, l equals 4, to be represented by a local variable. OK? But what about this example here, where we have variables s and l. s is shared and l is local. And I'll use that convention throughout the, the talk. And then we have a predicate. Oh, yeah, this is the example we saw before that's incorrect for more than one thread. 
and we have this predicate, s is not equal to l. So we build the Boolean program, as I showed you before, except we're doing it just at the template level. And we have this Boolean variable that tracks the predicate, s not equal to l. And now the question is, should we make this variable shared or local? And it's not immediately clear what we should do, or it wasn't clear to me initially, because this variable refers to both shared and local state. So what if we make it local? Well, the problem is that now if you look at this Boolean program, for any number of threads, we would say this program is correct, right? Because um, this predicate is initially true, and then we, we can't set it to false, right? So if it's true, it will remain true. So this is not a sound thing to do because we would deduce that our original program was correct if we regarded this as a signed abstraction when we know it's not. So clearly we can't just represent these, these mixed predicates using local variables. What about representing them? Oh yeah, in this example, if we made this a shared variable, then we would correctly deduce that the Boolean program is wrong. Okay? But what if we instead decided to represent these mixed predicates using shared variables? Well, this is an example where this wouldn't work either. It's a bit more of an intricate example. We have um, shared variable s, a shared Boolean flag f, and a local integer l. And a thread can either go into this conditional here, where if the flag is true, we assert that s and l are different. Okay? So if you imagine that one thread um, skips over here and performs this update, then s and l will be different. Sorry, let me just think about this. Yes. SNL will be the same for any other threads, right? No. no. I'm going to get myself confused here. Fine. Yeah. Um, they will be different, but only then sets up. Let me look at the abstraction. OK. Uh, Basically, I think I might have made a mistake in this example, but it's very easy to construct an example where if you represent these mixed predicates using shared variables, then you get unsoundness in the other direction. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to skip over this because I don't want to spend ages figuring out the details. I think I've made it. So you want to show an example David, where you, have two, you have two shared predicates, and because of that, you introduce the Cartesian abstraction introduces. I want, I want to introduce an example where if I make this mixed predicate, S not equal to L, be shared, then... I will incorrectly claim that the abstract program is correct when the concrete program is incorrect. I think this example does it, but I'm sorry, I prepared this during this PPOP conference over lunch, and um, yeah. I'll maybe look at it after the talk, and if anyone's interested, I'll go through the details. Okay. Um, and in this example, declaring this predicate to be local would work if the example were, were correct. Okay. So, uh, the idea was to establish with these examples that taking either one of these strategies of either making a mixed predicate be always local or making a mixed predicate be always shared, neither strategy works. Right? And now you might ask, well, okay, these examples were very contrived. If I did this in practice, would I maybe get reasonable results for a load of benchmarks? So these are benchmarks that I'll tell you a bit about later. But what I want to show you here is that if we try this approach of declaring mixed predicates to always be local or mixed predicates to always be shared, then we get very strange results. So here, what I'm saying is that um, unsafe means this is a buggy version of the example. So a correct verification result would be, to, the t would be to say that the example is unsafe. So if we declare mixed predicates as local variables, we frequently get the model checker telling us that these unsafe examples are safe, which is unsound. And if we also declare mixed predicates as shared variables, then in one case here, we find that the model checker tells us that the example is safe when it's not. And by no difference found, what I mean is that um, we don't manage to get a conclusive verification result and, adding, and we can't find any further predicates to add using our, our predicate discovery strategy. And I say that this is an erroneous result because with the symmetry aware approach, we don't get a no difference found. We actually get the right verification result. And a, a quick observation is that we'll never have we'll never get told that a safe example is unsafe, right? Because we get a counterexample, which we have to simulate over the original program, and we're never going to find that a safe program has a, a counterexample. Yeah? This is puzzling to me. The, if the, uh, suppose that you take the local state and you, um, and you replicate it 
uh, to make, instead of having two local variables, you have two shared variables. Yeah. And you just arrange it in such a way that the, the program one thread only accesses one of them and the other one only accesses the other one. Um, but in that case, all, all of your variables are shared. So in yep. that case, you don't have any mixed um, uh, predicates. So it's clear that all of the booleans should be should shared. Be shared. Okay. So that's precisely what we did in this. The first approach I showed you where we expanded the threads out separately, yeah? treated the threads local variables as being different variables, expanded the predicates to be distinct predicates. Yeah? Then we do the abstraction on a thread by thread basis. Then everything is shared. and. That's exactly what you proposed. But, but, but we're not doing that at the template level, and therefore we can't exploit symmetry but, in our model checking. But is that sound? I mean, yes, that's like the same thing to do. Yeah. So, right. Um, but uh, so how, I mean, how can the other one not be sound? I mean, the, that is, if you then take, if you're just pretending that things are more shared than they are, um, I, I guess, well, I'd, I'd like to see the other example. Um, I'll find OK, it. yeah. What's missing, Brett, what's missing here is you haven't really defined your notion of your abstraction of an individual process. Right? Because if you take that process and it has, say, a fixed vocabulary of predicates as a global yeah. program, a fixed set of globals that it knows about, and now you start composing these guys together, yeah. well, your global state now has n times that many global variables if you have made the shared, predi the, the shared predicates global. Okay, so the so vocabulary has changed, right, between an <coughs> instance of one process and now my composition. So you haven't said what happens is if I execute process one, what happens to the global variables it doesn't know about? I mean, are they staying the same when, when process one transitions? Or? So the idea here, these, you're talking about the Boolean programs having these global variables, right? Well, you're saying you're, you're locally abstracting one, one, uh, one thread yeah. to a Boolean program. Mm -hmm. That Boolean program has a vocabulary. It has a, sh a set of local variables and a set of shared yeah. variables. But its set of shared variables is not the complete set of shared variables. Well, in, so in this case, I'm proposing that it would be. So here, this would be the Boolean program for an arbitrary thread. Right. And the, this predicate here is, would just be a shared variable. And that when you compose this, this program many times, you only ever have two shared variables. Right. So I'm not so if you. So the one variable, so you're going to have one copy of that variable that stands for all. Yeah. Even though, in fact, it's representing. Uh, and that's why this doesn't work. Oh, yeah. obviously. So and, it and this doesn't is, work. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. And this is meant to be an example just to simulate oh, yeah. that. Yeah. Because you've got all these different local variables, so how can this one shared predicate. Exactly. Do so, the vector. Or you need to count. Or you need something else. Abstraction. Oh, you need it to, well, oh, so maybe I could show you this. Maybe I could now show you the solution right. rather than. Right. Or you yeah. need a lattice or something. Yeah. something. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. okay. So that's. So, all equals true, all equals false, or mixed or something. Yeah, so, if you, so basically, if you make these predicates, these mixed predicates, be local variables, then you don't communicate when you should communicate. Right. And mm -hmm. if you make them just be represented by a single shared variable, then a communication that's specific to one thread just is applied to all threads. So neither of these approaches make sense. And they don't work in practice. As, yeah, I guess you wouldn't expect. Okay, so now, so now you might ask, I'm going to show you how we can deal with mixed predicates in a signed way, but you might first ask, do we need them at all? Might it be possible to rewrite our program so we never have these mixed predicates? And it's very easy to construct an example where we do need mixed predicates. So this example is rather contrived. The idea is that only one thread will be able to get into this loop here. And this thread will increase these variables S and L and assert that they're equal. Right? S is a shared variable, L is a local variable. So, so it's clear that we want the mixed predicate S equals L to prove this program correct. And um, it, it can be shown that over a set of non-mixed predicates, you won't be able to compute an invariant strong enough to show this program is correct. If you assume unbounded integers with machine integers, you would need a very, very large number of predicates tracking the value of every, you know, every possible integer. OK. And then in practice also, let's have a look at this um, example of building a choir lock using test and set. So in this example, we do test and set on this lock variable to get back a condition, right? And if the condition is locked, then we know that the lock was already held. So we do this exponential back off and redo this, right? And what we want to assert is that once we have successfully acquired the lock, the condition should not be equal to locked. This should say not locked, this should be locked. Yeah, and this is something that we would represent very naturally by a mixed predicate. Lock is a global variable, cond is a local variable, right? So these mixed predicates, not only do we need them in theory, but in practice, they are useful for these sorts of examples. All right. So um, now I'm going to explain how we handle mixed predicates in a sound way in our symmetry-aware predicate abstraction technique. And I'm going to show you the technique if we assume no pointers first, and then I'll show you how pointers can be slotted in. This makes the presentation much easier and doesn't lose anything. So suppose we have a program P and a set of predicates. 
over the variables of p. We want to translate this into a Boolean program b so that bn approximates pn. And we want Boolean, program, Boolean variables b1 up to bm as usual. Our approach is to say that the Boolean variable bi is a shared variable if and only if the predicate phi i is shared. So if the predicate phi i only refers to the shared state, then the Boolean variable is a shared variable. Otherwise, we're going to make the predicate, the Boolean variable, local. So in particular, we are going to track mixed predicates in local variables. Uh, so clearly, we need something else up our sleeve, because I've shown you that that alone would be sound. So um, let's suppose we have an assignment, v becomes equal to e, a predicate phi and an associated variable b. And we want to work out what the effect on this predicate should be. So first of all, if v doesn't occur in phi, then the variable b won't change, because remember, I'm considering no pointers here. Otherwise, we need to update b in one of three ways. So suppose v and phi are both shared. So v is a shared variable and phi is a shared predicate. Then we can, so for example, if, we, if our statement is incrementing s with a predicate s is equal to 12, then we would just update b according to standard predicate abstraction. So we would do this, b equals b, um, if b then 0 else star. Okay, and because this predicate is shared, it's in a shared variable, it's in one place, this will be visible to all threads. So this is what we want. Okay? Let's suppose that v is local and phi is either local or mixed. So v is a, a variable local to a thread, and phi is a predicate that either is just over local variables or over a combination of variables. And we know v occurs in this predicate phi. Then it's sufficient just to update the predicate for the thread that executed the update because we've changed the truth of the predicate for, for that thread, but we clearly haven't changed the truth of the predicate for other threads because we didn't do a shared update. So, for example, the analogous um, example with L instead of S. So if we had the predicate L equals 12, then if this was true, it will be false. If we had the predicate L is equal to some shared variable S, if it was true for this thread, it will be false. But clearly, it's not going to become false for any other threads or become true for any other threads. So the interesting case is when we have v being a shared variable and phi a mixed predicate. So phi is a, ver a predicate over shared and local variables, so its truth will be thread dependent. And, and v is a shared variable. So by updating v, we are going to change the truth of this predicate potentially for every thread. But in the C program, in the high level program, one thread is going to actually execute this statement. Right? So um, something that would only change the shared state in the C program is going to change the state of many threads in the Boolean abstraction of this program. And we handle this using what we call the notify all update. So if we had a statement S++, a predicate that says L and S are equal, then what we do is for the local thread, we output a normal update to say that this, this thread's Boolean B representing this predicate gets updated in the usual way. But we also need to tell all the passive threads to update their local variable for this predicate appropriately. So. Um, we do this by introducing a new Boolean programming construct called a broadcast. So let's think about what a regular update on a local variable looks like. Suppose thread i executes some update. Then this causes thread i's program counter to increase and thread i's local state to change. What I'm going to introduce is a broadcast update, which is a thread executing, executing a statement that has no effect on the thread's local state, but changes the state of all passive threads. And once I've, I'll, I'll show you what this looks like, and then I'll show you how we use it. So we use this syntax square brackets v to mean that this L value is going to be um, changed in all passive threads, but not in the active thread. So suppose we had this state here where um, the active thread is i. Okay, so its program count is going to change, but its local state isn't going to change. And the local states of all the other threads are going to change if we do a broadcast. So v in brackets, so I'll call, I'll call this passive v. So passive v becomes equal to something, where v is a local variable. This causes the active thread to step forward in, its, in where it is in the program, and for the states of all passive threads to be updated. Yeah? This means some r value. So this is just the right-hand side of the assignment. Can it refer to local variables at else of i? So should it, should it not? So we'll come to that. Yep. So yes, the answer is it. In, in our work, it, in principle, it could refer to the local variables of any threads. And, uh, and we find it useful to, to allow it to refer to the variables of the active thread and the variables of the passive thread. Yeah? Oh, wait a second. But that's, oh, so you're saying that. Uh, I'm confused. So why 
Why do you have this notion of the active thread not changing its focal state? Um, I think that will become clear when I show you an example on the next slide. Okay. okay. But tell me if it's not. So this broadcasts um, something to all passive threads. But so. I'm sorry, but fundamentally, each. Can you go back? To yeah. yeah. Understand exactly what that means. So the passive threads are about to execute some statement, but they're all basically disabled. Um, and you're going to you're going to do, but you're going to sort of uh, tell them to update what their low, their predicate corresponding to fee. Yeah. So we're not going to tell them to update it. We're just going to update it for them. We're going to update it. Yeah, synchronously. So all at once. You can imagine like a loop that executes atomically and just changes the states of all the other threads. OK. Yes. Uh, on the previous slide, I think you had, uh, uh, yes, notify all updates on shared B. Right. On this slide, B is shared. And then on the new slide, B is local. OK, so this is. Um, um, so in this slide, by V I mean a variable in the C program. Yes. And in this slide, I mean a Boolean variable, a variable in the Boolean program. So I really should have said B, not V there, to, to make this clearer. Thanks uh, for that. Here's Thanks for that. B. Yeah, should, yeah. I mean, V it could be V, but would, would would be clearer if I had said B, not V. Yeah. So yeah, here V is a local variable. So, and on the previous slide, V was so shared. Can we assume that for any given program, the number of different values of dot 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 is finite? The number of different values of dot, dot, dot. Uh, in a Boolean program, yes, because, well, I mean, syntactically, no. Well, the, the, but the dot, dot, dot is an expression not on a Boolean variable. Okay, well, it, on the variables. It's on our values, as you said. From, it's on our value from the original program. Um, no, no, this is in the Boolean program we're going to do this. Yeah, is so. Boolean value? Yeah, so we're updating this. So this is in our abstract program. We're going to introduce this statement to us. Um, this is a, a Boolean program variable, and we're going to update it in all other threads using Boolean program variables from, well, we'll come to from which threads that will come from. I think when I show you this in the context of the abstraction, hopefully it will be clear. So um, I'm going to introduce a bit of notation. So suppose phi is a predicate. Then if I put phi in square brackets, what I mean syntactically is uh, a formula equivalent like, like phi, but every local variable L is replaced with L in square brackets. So this is phi in the context of a passive thread. So this is like another thread's take on phi. Uh, so for example, if we had the predicate s is equal to l, if I put that in spare brackets, I mean s is equal to passive l. So now that's really mixed, because s is a C program variable, and bracket l is a Boolean program. No, no, no. It, this, would be, this would be a predicate over the C program. So s is oh. a shared variable, and l is a local variable in the C program. Yeah. Uh, OK, so. Okay. Yeah. So here, phi refers to a predicate over the original program. No, I know that, but I thought that the brackets. So the, yeah. So in our so we're going to use the brackets on both levels. We're going to use the brackets at the C program level during our abstraction, and we're going to use the brackets in the Boolean program syntax to represent broadcasts. Okay. So you're overloading the brackets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But which which L are you referring to? I mean, L is is local to each one. Of the yeah. Yeah. Aspects. So this is uh, just. At the moment, if you can just think about this as a piece of syntax, so we mean in some passive thread. And then I hope it will become clear what I mean when I show you how we use it. So um, yeah, if we have an assignment v becomes equal to e, a predicate phi, and a variable b, then if v is shared and phi is mixed, we're going to do one of these notify all updates. So what we generate is a parallel assignment. So we say that b, this is the, the Boolean variable corresponding to phi, in the active thread, it gets updated according to usual predicate abstraction rules. And simultaneously, B in every other thread gets updated, right? But this is the, where, where this uh, phi in square brackets gets updated, gets used. So um, the, the, uh, we're updating B in another thread because the version of phi for that thread, its truth may be changed by this shared update. So we need to update it to reflect the weakest precondition for it to hold in this other thread after the assignment of v, not in the other thread, but in the active thread, right, being updated with r value e. So why can't I just think of this bracket thing as like tid? That's what, sir? Tid, thread ID. It, it's sort of like because we're not talking about because we're not talking about a specific. Yeah. So one addition we could have used we could have used v underscore j. Yeah, we could have used 
It's we could have written for all i, v underscore i, but we wanted something we could write in our programs. The point is, he just needs two vocabularies. I yeah. want to talk about the thread that's moving, yep. and I want to talk about the thread that's being side affected. Not the thread that's being side affected, but like any thread that's being side yeah. affected. Yeah. But the point is, you're thinking about only pairwise interactions yeah. on these two thread, of these two thread local states. Right? So, and, and then you're sort of taking the Cartesian product of all those pairwise interactions, and you're saying, Okay, this thread that's moving interacts with this thread in the following way, and that thread in the following way, and that thread in the following way. Those interactions may be correlated, but we lose those correlations. In the yeah, answer. I mean, so, so maybe a clearer way of writing it would be, would be something like saying B equals blah, 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 and for all I, B I equals blah, 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 blah. Right? So we, we played we play with various different notations for this, but yeah, m m maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. And yeah, these statements are executed simultaneously. So let's look at this on an example. Suppose we have this assignment, s becomes equal to l, s is shared, l is local, and we have a mixed predicate that tracks whether s and l are equal. And there's a corresponding Boolean variable b. So we generate this, OK? So don't parse this, let's simplify it. So let's look at the, the top line. Um, the weakest precondition for s to be equal to l after s, the assignment s equals l, is s, l and l being equal, which is true. OK, so this turns into b equals 1. Right? So clearly, if a thread says s becomes equal to l, then for that thread, s and l will be equal. So what about the other threads? Well, the weakest precondition for um, well, so this formula, s is equal to l in a passive thread, this means that the shared variable l is equal to the passive threads l. And the weakest precondition for that to hold after the assignment is that the active and passive thread have the same value of l. Right? OK. So now, how do we compute this? So this relates to your question as to what the R value should be, right? what we should allow on the right-hand side of these assignments, which threads should we allow, um, are, should we be able to read from? Yeah. So um, which predicate should we, should we give to the F operator? So the obvious predicates we have at our disposal are the predicate phi, so S is equal to L, and the predicate passive phi, S is equal to Passive L. So what we might try is saying, let's just give the F operator, because we're updating a variable in a passive thread, let's just give the operator predicates of the passive thread. So in this case, what we would be trying to do is to strengthen L is equal to passive L just over the predicate S is equal to passive L. And it's hopefully clear that the best we can do here is false, right? And same for the negation. So in this case, we would say passive V becomes a good star everywhere. So we would say, we've updated the shared variable, so let's just kill all the information in other threads about that shared variable. And that would clearly be a sound thing to do, but perhaps not a very useful thing to do. So um, we can do better if we allow the F operator to range over variables, uh, predicates in the passive thread and predicates in the active thread. So in this case, we'd be computing the strengthening of L is equal to passive L, but over two predicates. So S is equal to passive L and S is equal to L. And now we can do significantly better, right? So um, we can say that L will certainly be equal to passive L if S is equal to passive L and S is equal to L, OK? Because they're both equal to S. And we can say that these things won't be equal if we have either S being equal to passive L and S not being equal to active L, or vice versa. So uh, the strengthening of the, the expression is the conjunction of these predicates, and the strengthening of the negation is the exclusive or of the predicates. And this is a much more precise thing to say. So we say here, B is a choice between these two things. And now I wonder if maybe the interplay between applying the brackets operator to the Boolean variables and applying brackets operator to the C program variables is now a bit clearer. So during abstraction, our abstraction engine is given these bracketed variables in the program. But what it will generate is something over passive and active predicates. So I mean, I wonder if it might have been clearer to use two different, yeah, maybe to not overload these things. I think they're kind of naturally related, and for, for me, overloading this works. Why, why couldn't I just think of this, though, as being sort of the ordinary um, you know, Cartesian predicate abstraction of two processes, the active and the passive? Uh, is, is that, I mean, can I just think of it that way and then say, OK, now for my whole collection of processes, I'll just take the conjunction of all those things for all of, the, uh, for all of those pairs? For all the active, passive pairs. I don't think it's the same because I think if you just 
took the Cartesian abstraction of a pair of processes, you wouldn't correctly um, simulate the effect of updating all processes. Well, you'd be updating all the processes individually and then taking the cross product of all those updates. So if you considered each pair separately and then combine them. Right. You consider each, you pick one to be active, now consider all the pairs consisting of the active one and a passive one, right? Predicate abstract that and do a Cartesian abstraction going forward, right? And now you're going to wind up with states, you know, for each active successor state, and you're going to wind up with corresponding passive successor states for each of the other processes, take the Cartesian product of all of that. Is that, is that what you get? Um, I don't think I fully understand what you mean, but I think that you might get something equivalent to this thing of expanding the program and doing the most precise abstraction you can. Right. Well, the most, this wouldn't be the most precise no, abstraction because it would lose all the correlations between the passives. Yeah, between the passives, yes, yeah. right. so, and it so does do that. You're capturing the correlation between, between active and passive and for so each passive individually. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. The correlation between the passives is being lost. Yeah. That seems to me the information that's being lost in this. That is exactly right. the information that's being lost. And you can come up with examples. When I said we haven't implemented constraint style refinement in our tool yet, that's because you, you get counterexamples that say that this update is, this transition is infeasible because of information in other passive threads. Um, yeah, and we, we would need some, some notation and machinery for including that in our Boolean language. Okay, so the answer is I think so, but I'd like to talk, talk more about it. So, yeah, this is the approach we take. And, uh, it may seem kind of arbitrary. This is saying, let's update the passive thread considering no other threads. And here we're saying, let's, con let's update the passive thread considering one other, th other thread. We could consider two or three threads. But this seems very natural because the active thread did the update. So hopefully the active thread state is going to be useful in determining how we should update the passive thread state. But it's not always enough. All right, so the price here is that this F operator now computes over twice as many predicates in the worst case. So we give the operator the predicates of the active thread and the predicates of the passive thread. But that's not as bad as what I showed you before where we have n times m, where n is the number of threads. All right. So given an assignment v equals e, the way we do this in practice, so I showed you how we update with respect to one predicate. But in practice, what we do is we compute the indices of those predicates for which we need to do a broadcast. So we work out this is when we're, working out, when we're figuring out the abstraction. We work out the indices of the predicates that are mixed and that have um, this variable v in them. So for all predicates, we do the usual thing of, of um, simultaneously updating all the active threads, Boolean variables, using standard predicate abstraction. And then for the predicates with these indices, we do a broadcast. And this is one big parallel assignment. Yeah? Does that, does that make sense? So this is just putting together what I showed you before. OK. So what, what about pointers? Now, I'll briefly show you how we can adapt this to take pointers into account. So I'm not going to tell you anything interesting about how to do concurrent alias, alias analysis, which is a difficult problem. But let's assume we have an alias analysis procedure that's concurrency aware. And let's also assume that it will reject the program conservatively if the situation of having a pointer from shared state to local state can occur. Because like I told you at the beginning, we, we restrict our attention to not consider those programs. So, Otherwise, the procedure will yield a relation points to D. So um, we write x points to dy if x may point to y at program point D, right? You know, the wonderful thing about flow and sensitive alias analysis is that, in effect, it just treats all statements as flying around in big suit and parallel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so fundamentally, Maybe you don't pointer analyses, if they're, if they're um, imprecise enough, simulate concurrency already, uh -huh. so depending on which one you pick. Uh, if you want too much precision, then if you want a lot of precision like flow sensitivity, then you lose, yeah, you lose the concurrency aspect. But it turns out that if you're very imprecise, you simulate a concurrency. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. So we've done something very crude to make our analysis concurrent. And I'm, I don't know too much about concurrent analyses, like Reynard's analysis, for example, but we're hoping to look into doing that in the future. I don't know whether it scales. But let's suppose we have this black box. So um, the locations of a variable v, we just say is the set v. Okay? Here I'm assuming that pointers point to variables. I'm not thinking about uh, records and arrays. But with some tedious work, this could be generalized to that situation. And we say the locations of a dereference are the variable you're dereferencing and anything it could point to. So locations of an expression are anything you would need to read to evaluate the expression. And uh, this can be defined recursively for more for compound expressions. In this, and then we say that the 
So capital lock of phi is the union of the locations at any program point. So before we said a predicate was shared if it only involved shared variables, mixed if it involved both local and shared. So now we just uh, generalize this. So we say that a predicate is shared if its global locations are a subset of the shared variables, local, uh, mixed otherwise. So this is the obvious generaliz generalization to take pointers into account. Um, and then to abstract assignments, uh, we, so this is our definition of lock. And we have a corresponding definition of targets. So the targets of a variable um, are just the variable, and the targets of the reference are just what the variable can point to. So this, so this captures what you could change by writing through this L value. OK? So now, when do we need to do a broadcast? Well, suppose we have an assignment, phi becomes equal to E. And I write phi because phi could be a variable or it could be a dereference. And we assume that you've pre-processed your program so that you don't have multiple dereferences as an L value. So if the predicate um, we're assigning to psi, and we want to know, do we need to broadcast to other threads regarding the predicate phi? Well, we need to do this when phi is a mixed predicate using this pointer aware definition of mixed. And when there is some variable v, which is shared and belongs to the locations of psi at this program point and to the targets of psi. Sorry, this should be the locations of phi, not the locations of psi. Yeah, so a variable v that is relevant to phi at this program point and which could be changed by assigning through psi at this program point. So I hope, it, I hope it's clear that if you, uh, with, with these new definitions, then everything I showed you before would now work for pointers. The challenge would be, of course, doing the alias analysis. So now I'll briefly tell you about how we've looked at the rest of the CGAR process. So we built a tool which we call SIM SATABS. This is based on Daniel Croning's SATABS model checker. So uh, we've implemented this new predicate abstraction scheme in the, the model checker. And then to do the actual checking, we've extended BOOM, which is this symmetry-capable uh, Boolean program model checker. We've extended it to be able to do these broadcasts which required some non-trivial modifications. And they're quite computationally expensive to perform, which is why we've been careful in this work to try to work out as precisely as possible when you must do a broadcast and not do a broadcast unless you have to. Because the way this symbolic counter abstraction works, these broadcasts are quite expensive to, to realize. Simulation required only trivial modifications. And then with refinement, so with predicate discovery, if we discover a predicate by doing, say, weakest precondition on a counterexample trace, like L3 is less than S, so local variable of process 3 is less than shared variable s. Then we simply add the generic predicate, l is less than s, to our set of predicates. So this adds the predicate for all different threads. Um, and we never get predicates like l1 being less than l2, because in our program, we could never compare local variables of different threads. So this is actually very straightforward. And then uh, transition refinement, constraint style transi transition refinement. This is in progress. The problem is you may get a spurious transition between two abstract states, but these states will refer to very specific thread IDs. And then in your Boolean program, you want to add a constraint to rule out this transition. And doing that in, well, you can't add a constraint about specific threads. If you did, you would destroy symmetry, which is the thing that makes our approach scale. So we're working out a way to, um, to be able to write a generic constraint, which will involve some quantification, will involve extending our Boolean programming language a bit and extending the BBoom model checker accordingly. OK, so I'll tell you briefly about experimental results. I'm nearly at an hour. Can, can I go on a little bit longer? Yeah, OK. So these examples are, are mostly working on lock-free data structures. So we've got a lock-based and a CAS-based counter, a pseudo-random number generator, um, a lock-based and a CAS-based stack that supports concurrent pushes and pops, then these, these uh, concurrent lock implementation examples like I showed you earlier, and also some examples on finding the maximum element in an array. So relatively small, but not completely trivial C programs. And we have simple properties that we're checking specified as assertions in the, in the source code. And for each version, we've injected a bug. So we have a correct version and a buggy version. Um, the, way we, the way we've evaluated this experimentally is by comparing our symmetry aware approach against the symmetry oblivious approach that, approach that I mentioned to you at the beginning of the talk, where we just expand the threads out. So what I'm claiming is that our approach gives you faster abstraction times because you abstract over fewer predicates, just the predicates of, mostly just the predicates of one thread. And when you need to do a broadcast, the predicates of two threads, the active thread and some passive thread. 
Um, and then model checking is faster because of the symmetry reduction. So uh, mi mixed predicates were necessary for all of these examples except for the lock-based pseudorandom number generator and the lock-based stack implementation. And the intuition here is that to build these lock-free versions, you need to do these tests that check whether some local variable is still equal to a shared variable. And that's, that's a kind of good source of a mixed predicate. So it's not really a surprise that in these versions where you imagine you have a lock as a primitive language construct, you don't necessarily need mixed predicates. How do you model a lock? How do we model a lock in stat tabs? So we actually cheat. We just have something called C prove it atomic, right? Which just makes uh, this, it's like atomic in Promola. So, so that, that's how we model a lock in, in these and benchmarks. Decided, what you write, what's the, then, then the code you want to be executed until, uh, and then so end atomic. What I'm, I guess what I'm asking, do you model locks as, as a Boolean variable? Or yeah. As a, as a yeah, Boolean yeah. variable. Mm -hmm. okay. One more question. When you say you, are, you verified a CAS-based stack, yeah. Were the CAS operations just used to implement a lock, or were they being used to, you know, flip pointers and things like that? So I'm not actually sure. This comes from a, an open source IBM implementation, and our student Alex Kaiser, he, he worked on this. I believe it's not just implementing a lock on the stack. I believe it's an actual lock-free stack. Okay. But I haven't looked into the details, but uh, I, can, I know where it is online and we can look at it. So, so uh, this stack example was written in Java, um, and he ported it to C, which is what our model checker works on. Tantalizingly, he found a bug in the IBM implementation, but untantalizingly, the bug manifests with only one thread. So uh, it's <laughs> not very interesting for us to say we found this bug. with. this code never run? Uh, it, so it's from this book, Concurrency um, Design Patterns. Yeah. So, yeah. So we uh, experiment on a 3 gigahertz Intel Xeon. We have a timeout of one hour, and we do the Cartesian abstraction with a maximum cube length of three. So in blue, I've indicated which method performs best. So you can see here we have the number of predicates required for the symmetry oblivious method, which you can see grows with the number of threads, the number of predicates required with the symmetry aware method, which is independent of the number of threads, because this is the number of like pre generic predicates. Then we have the time taken for abstraction in symmetry oblivious and symmetry aware approaches respectively, and the time taken for model checking. So here, model checking is performed with bboom, our extension of the boom tool. And here, we took the best time between SMV and boom with no symmetry reduction. Um, so you can see that we get signif significant speed ups on many of the examples we can verify. Uh, so we show the largest thread count here that we can verify with each approach. So in this example, we've shown a mixture of thread counts, but 10 was the largest thread count we could verify without symmetry whereas we could go up to 20, but not further with symmetry. So we can check interesting thread counts. Obviously, beyond a certain point, checking more threads isn't that interesting. So the important thing is, for, for some of these cases, we could only check very small count, thread counts without exploiting symmetry, but we can check larger thread counts with symmetry. Um, any questions about the experiments? So it seems like there are now two differences between symmetry oblivious and symmetry aware. Right. Now, one of them is that you're doing this uh, active-passive abstraction yeah. of the transition relation in the symmetry aware, but not the symmetry oblivious. Yes, yeah, symmetry oblivious computes a more precise abstraction, which is why it takes longer. Yeah. And the second one is, of course, that in the symmetry aware, you are splitting symmetry, you know, yeah. counter abstraction. But even in even without using, it seems to me that even without using your um, you know active-passive approximation yeah right that the system is still symmetric yeah right? and that you could still apply symmetry reduction techniques even without that okay so we have a little bit so with the symmetry oblivious approach if you expand the threads out and then abstract thread one to get a boolean program then you know the boolean program for thread two is going to be the same but you just switch thread ids right so what we did with these experiments is we actually didn't implement that but we divided the abstraction time by the number of threads to be fair so because it would be possible to compute the precise abstraction for one thread and then generate the abstract versions for the other threads, uh, that would require some very tedious yeah, implementation work. So right, but you could also use sort of traditional symmetry reductions you know, on, the, on the version that is still exact and doesn't use your, um, your active passive process. So you mean we, we end up with this? OK, uh, so, so the trouble is that um, we aren't aware of a way of 
doing that in, in practice, like a model checker that can take a set of processes and do symbolic symmetry reduction. So yeah, we could give this to something like spin, say, and do symmetry reduction, or Murphy. But then we would, that would be hopeless because of the problem of non-deterministic Boolean variables, right? So with a, with a large number of Boolean variables, the state space would be So what you're saying, yeah. so what you're saying is okay, there's no you know, symbolic implementation of that symmetry reduction. Yeah. I'm not saying that symmetry reduction would necessarily work well. You know, but it's something we would like to. I'm trying to say that there's sort of two orthogonal things going on here, right? Yeah, so one is computing an efficient abstraction. Right, one is the abstraction you're performing, and the other is the symmetry quotient. Yeah. Right? Which could, in principle, be applied on both, although you don't have the tools to apply sure. it. Yeah, that's you know, absolutely correct. Right. Okay. So you're saying I should really multiply, like, um, the abstraction, like, like the 13 on the first row, I should really multiply it by 6 to get the true time? Well, to get the true time that we actually spent. So we left this running like over a week or whatever, and that's how long it actually took because we just abstracted thread 1, and then we abstracted thread 2 and thread 3. But if I'd sat down for like two days or something or less, I could have, or maybe three hours, I don't know how long, I could implement a tool that could take the abstraction for one thread and produce, just using syntactic changes, abstractions for the other threads. Okay. So it would be pretty unfair of us to report that multiplied time given that this is like an implementation trick that we just haven't had time to do okay. ourselves. So we had to use, obviously we used the time out of longer than one hour for those examples. We multiplied the time out for abstraction by the number of threads oh, because, okay, if, gotcha. yeah, yeah. And then once again, just, just, I showed you this comparison of the unsigned approaches before showing they're no good and I just want to show you that, well, the symmetry error approach is good. It gives you the right result in, in all cases. Okay, so uh, future work in, in that's some of it is in progress. So this constrained style refinement um, is important. So because we don't have this, we had to give quite a lot of predicates manually for our examples. So if we give fewer predicates, then satabs just can't find any more useful predicates and the abstraction isn't precise enough. So I'm, I'm looking forward to solving that problem. The abstraction time is very high because we don't take advantage of procedural information, right? So when you're abstracting one procedure, we're considering predicates like over all other procedures. But the challenge with concurrency, which I'd love to talk to you guys about, is that when you're abstracting over these passive threads, then they could be in any procedure. So you, you, know, you don't know where they are. So yeah, I don't know if there are any like, cool analyses to deduce that two procedures can't be mutually occupied, or you know, I don't know if that really happens in practice in interesting concurrent programs. We need a, we've got a very crude concurrent AS analysis. It'd be nice to get a smarter one to deal with heat manipulating programs. Um, there's this large block encoding that's been successful in the BLAST model checker. Uh, it would be good to try that, but with concurrency, suddenly it seems less effective, right? Because you can't just munge together a block of statements if some shared variable access is, is in the block of statements. So we would need to do this, this uh, large block encoding much more conservatively than it can be applied on sequential programs. As I've said, we're, we're going to uh, look at trying to analyze programs with weak memory models. Um, and my, I'm not so interested in parameterized verification personally. I think, you know, for me, showing that something works up to an interesting thread count is kind of enough. But my colleagues are very interested in parameterized verification and have techniques from CAV last year, which in principle could be applied directly in our current setting to use this cutoff detection method to show that once you've checked up to a certain number of threads, any larger thread count will be safe. And for some technical reasons, we can't yet apply that. Like, in theory, there's no reason why we shouldn't apply it, but for some technical reasons, which I don't fully understand, we, we can't yet. But yeah, this is something that they're, they're definitely going to look into. Um, finally, just to summarize, well, maybe I don't need to labor this point. I'm sorry, the, the, yeah, because when you do the counter abstraction with acceleration for certain types of parameterized uh, systems, uh, finite state, you can, you can, I mean, there are these classic results, right, about counter abstraction with yeah. acceleration. Right. So this is Carp Miller thing, right? Yeah. 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 Right. But that's extremely expensive. That's like double the exponential. And at CAV last year, my colleagues have a more efficient technique where you where you check your system for thread count after thread count after thread count, and in successive checks, you you look for something, and I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's something that tells you that's enough. You don't need to go any further, right? But implementing it, the the trick, the problem is implementing it symbolically is non-trivial. Yeah. So they have an explicit state algorithm for doing it, and I think they're working on a on a symbolic version, but don't yet have it. Um, okay, so in summary, instead of expanding P and abstracting the resulting program, which would be very expensive, both to abstract and check, we're abstracting at the template level, which is scalable, expanding this, um, but checking it by exploiting symmetry. And because 
symmetry reduction gives you a bi-simulation, then this is a sound thing to do. We've published this as a, as a technical report as well as having submitted a paper to Cavanet. And yeah, I'd love to talk to you all about it now, or you can email me if you're interested in getting hold of the tool and trying it.